the Nords. Whereas the hundred kingdoms and the city-states might claim to be the main bastions of human civilization, one should not assume that this means they are the sole bastions of human might. Far to the north, beyond the monster-infested Northern Sea, lies Mannheim, home of the Nords. These people have led the savage and relentless war against their southern cousins. It is a war of raids and plunder, a war of countless battles and bloodshed. But above all, it is a war of vengeance. It would be easy to denigrate the Nords as bloodthirsty beast spawn, no better than the monsters they lead to battle. To do so would belittle the achievement that crossing the white waste represents. It would demean the seamanship, courage and fortitude required to circumnavigate the continent and wage war on the far southern shores. But above all, it would demean the achievement that survival, let alone dominance in Mannheim represents. Had the gods themselves created a crucible to test mankind, they could not have crafted a worse hell than the icy lands of the northern continent. This adversity has honed the Nords into one of the toughest and most dangerous foes one can encounter on the field of battle. The first recorded name for this northern continent is Vanirheim. This is a human name paying tribute to the masters of that age, the Vanir. Very little is known about them and their rule. What little is known is only through a cloud of myth and legend according to which the Vanir were gods. Once split by internal strife, they united with their cousins, the Asir, to cast down the dragons, subjugate their servants, and rule over man from this, their seat of power, Yggdrasil, a vast tree that connected the bowels of the earth to the sky above. They were ruled by a god named Odin, and bound by faith to die at Ragnarok. In preparation for this final battle, they selected the most courageous and resourceful of Nord warriors and took them from their tribes at the moment of their death. When it came, the Vansnir's end, it came in the form of Sutr, a terrible being of light and fire. It had been foretold that Hemeldar, most vigilant of the Vanir, would sound his horn, wake the mortal host and herald the beginning of Ragnarok, the twilight of the Vanir. This never happened. Loki, the visionary, the outcast, the traitor, struck Hemildar down before he could marshal the Vanir and their host of warriors, the Enharjar. Thus, throughout Ragnarok, the Enharjar slumbered in their golden halls. Sutter and his fire giants burned the land, raised Yggdrasil, and grew drunk on the blood of gods and men alike, before they were cast back at tremendous cost. The power of the Vanir was shattered, and the gods themselves were lost. In the aftermath of this terrible conflict, the Norse watch in terror as the Yontar, fierce giants, spawns of Timir, firstborn of ice and fire, slowly descended into the wasteland that Ragnarok had left behind. They came from their fastness in the icy peaks to punish humanity for the thousands of years of insult and injury they had suffered at the hands of the Vanir. One by one, the Norse settlements fell as the Fimbul winter followed the Yontar, an unending winter on the land. Man suffered and died under Yontar rule, populations declined precipitously, and extinction loomed. The few that survived did so as slaves of the Yontar, surviving in caves heated by lava flows at the whim and pleasure of their cruel masters. Salvation, when it arrived, came from a forgotten place. Through accident or quirk of fate, in which the Nords place much weight, the Enihar awoke decades too late to fight the battle they had been promised. Of the thousands selected throughout the years by the Vanir, only a fraction awoke. The rest passed away in their sleep, or else, some claim, slumber still. Instead of waking up to a glorious battle against their eternal foes, they woke to find the gods dead, their lands a frigid wasteland in which humanity survived only at the whim of the Yontar. This would not stand. The untrammeled fury of the Enerhar raged across the icy landscape, sweeping the Yontar and all their works before them in a tidal wave of blood and savagery, the release slaves at their sides. With the Yontar defeated, the ice slowly dis receded, and humanity established itself again in the north under the watchful eye of the Enhar. So mindful of their creators, the Enhar led the surviving Nords as kings, leaders, and seers, denying all claims to divinity, but guiding the Nords once more along the path of the forgotten Vanir, promising that the gods would return. 
but the gods did not return, and slowly the Einhar were lost. Some simply vanish. Others started losing their humanity, devolving into beasts and monsters, often dragging entire tribes in their wake. Others still were lost, challenging those of their kin that had fallen. Today only a handful of Einhar remain active, their names and legends guiding the Nords more actively than they ever did in person. Through all adversities and challenges, the Nords have adapted, learning to endure their environment and coexist with their fallen kin. With their hatred and numbers renewed, they keep their vengeful eyes turned to the soft lands of the south, bent on revenge on the children of Sutur, who stole their destiny and their gods. The tale of Hewell the fisherman, and the knight of the bright tree. Gather round the heart, now gather, and Nana will tell you the tale of Hijul and the knight of the bright tree. It was the darkest night of the year, it had been a lean year, a poor year, for war was waging in the land and too many an end of day had found the nests of fishermen empty or as close as can be. Hiju was no exception, and if anything he was one of those mostly afflicted, but he was of sturdy folk, Hiju such as our village makes, for he was indeed one of our own, no matter what others claim and he was also a proud father and a pious man, venerating the Asir and the Vanir as was proper. It was his love for his family and his faith and his gods that urged him to the sea that day, for in good Hijul's mind, both deserved a feast and a tribute on the most sacred of winter nights. And so it was he, that he left the shores even before the bright hours had come, along with others that shared as brave a heart as him. Before the sun even rose, they pushed their boats on the ice, guided by their lanterns on their boats' bows, until they reached the water, and from there they sailed straight south. At the start of the bright hours, he threw his first net with the others, but as was usual that year, the nets came up empty. As the bright hours reached their peak, he and a handful of others, no more, sailed further south and tried again, but still their nets would come out empty. One by one his fellows made their way to the frozen shores, but Hijul's pride was hurt and his honor wounded. Alone he sailed still, until the shore behind him looked distant, and Mannheim was but an island to him. And there, as the bright hours faded finally, he threw his nets for a third time. He waited long in the cold and bitter wet winds. He waited till winter dust settled, and the lights of his fellows' boats disappeared in the north. He waited till dark came upon him, and the only light in sight was his own weak lantern. He waited till the longest night of the year swallowed him, and even the flame of his lantern seemed to wither. Tucked in his furs, he waited, his boat rocking gently on black waves, his light, a lone star dancing in the darkness with its oil running out. Hours passed, and Hijo looked with desperation as his small flame withered and he thought then that when the light runs out that he would know the gods did not wish for fish of him this year and he could return. So he kept his eyes peeled on the light, ever withering, never gone. The light kept shining. That was the first miracle of the night of the burning tree, for the oil never did run out. Now below, the elusive fishes that hid and shield away all year long, they saw his pale enduring lantern, and to their desperate eyes it seemed like the sun. For if you think that nights are dark for us Nords in the winter, then know for the fish it is worse for they swim in the void. So lured they were by the promise of sun in the form of a small lantern, that they rushed in Hijul's nest by the dozens. And that was the second miracle of the night of the bright tree. Rejoice in thanking the gods for their kindness, he should gather his nest, full and rich for the first time that year. He laughed in the dark and prepared to come home, only to realize finally what the price for his fish was. For in the longest night of the year, the dark of the sky and the dark of sea are one, the clouds hiding stars and the glow of the bit frost both. Hijul was lost and knew not where land was. Now some say that was the end of Hiju, some say that he never returned and no one ever heard of him since, 
Others say he is alone in the dark still, his little fisherman boat floating in the long dark of the night sky, and that by his lantern the star Yoldi do sailors know to find south, and by the torch of his waiting wife the star Gilde do they know to find north. But we of our village remember what others won't. In his dark desperation Hijul saw a light appear in the north, bright and branched with a glow that touched the clouds and he knew where the land was. He promised the gods, and his laugh echoed in the dark, then tanked them as tears froze in his eyes. It was the third and final miracle, the miracle of Hijul, a miracle that came with sacrifice, as do all things, for that was the night of Ragnarok and the burning of Yggdrasil, the longest night of the year and all years since, the night we remember with Hijul's name and call the Night of the Bright Tree. On the gods of Yggdrasil. The first recorded name for the northern continent of Ea is Avarheim. This is a human name, playing tribute to the masters of that age, the Asir and the Vanir. Very little is known of this time and what is only through a cloud of myth and legend. Under constant threat of the Yontar, giant humanoids native to the lands, the Nord gods wanted their people to be warriors, strong and enduring, with brave hearts and ready hands, ready to prove themselves to their Valkyries so they can be taken to Valhalla and join the Einarhar. All this is reflected in the early Norse civilization. Their crafts focused solely on weapons, ships and fishing, while their tradition was mostly oral since their history and the hellish conditions of their land did not promote such activities as studying and record keeping. Their society revolved around raids and fighting with minimal agriculture, tribal art and almost non-existent formal education. Beyond the teachings of sagas that venerated bravery and the gods, as a result, their oral tradition was rich, richer perhaps than any other civilization of their time. They would be collected and put to paper centuries after their conception, and through them the facts behind the myths and legends would be partially revealed. According to the sagas, the Asir and the Vanir were gods. Once split by internal strife, they united to cast down the dragons, which had in turn defeated the giants, in order to subjugate their servants and rule over man from their seat of power. Yggdrasil, a vast tree that connected the bowels of the earth to the sky above. They were ruled by a god named Odin, bound by fate to die Ragnarok. Yeah. In preparation for this final battle, they selected the most courageous and resourceful of the Nord warriors and took them from their tribes at the moment of their death. Their end would come in the form of Sutur, a being of fire and light, of terrifying power, and his children, the fire giants. They would burn the land, raise Yggdrasil, and slay countless men and gods before they were stopped. Had they scholars of their own or an interest in the history of their hated foes, today's Nords would perhaps see the coincidences in history and timing as clearly as a scholar of the present day can. It would take centuries for the reality behind their myths to be collected, analyzed, and in the end understood. Still, out of the many Norse sagas recounting the deeds of both gods and human heroes from those ancient times, most are impossible to translate into historical facts if indeed they reflect any. Their significance in the grand scheme of things seems obscure, if at all existent. Three major legends, however, can paint a very specific picture, one that would shape the image of history, the gods themselves, the Einhar and Ragnarok. It is safe to assume that the gods were in fact a powerful faction within the exiles, powerful enough perhaps to have won the original conflict with the dragons. The source of this power seems to have steamed from a civil war among them, and unlike all other instances, their subsequent reunification. Some scholars theorize that their veneration as gods and protectors from the giants, native to the frozen land of the north, could have also added to their power, in a manner similar to the ascendancy of Hazila. The truth is, however, that there is little concrete evidence to support this, and perhaps there is no need to make such assumptions. The Nord gods were the only example of cooperation between what are known today as exiles of the spires and the weavers. Considering their civilization had crafted the ways and could travel between worlds, one can only imagine the miracles they could accomplish together. This unique cooperation lends credence to the distinction of Nord gods as Asir and Vanir, as well as the legends of Yggdrasil itself. After all, no other combination between spiral biomancy and weaver life binding is known. 
These gods of legends, Odin, Thor, Freya, seem to have been kings or leaders within their community. Loki, powerful and dark figure within the Norse mythology, was possibly one as well, but an outcast of some sort. It is easy to imagine an alliance between the two races would have been based on some moderation of the use of biomancy on behalf of the Spire Lords. Loki's appellation as the father of monsters and the roles those monsters would play in Ragnarok could fit neatly into a narrative as a spire biomancer who refused to accommodate his peers. Legends such as those of Fenris, Jormungandr, and even Loki's own shapeshifting suddenly take on a more disturbing aspect. Under this light, the promise of Valhalla and the legends of the Enhar, chosen warriors of the gods, also take a disturbing turn. If the gods were truly spires and weavers, what were they doing those warriors that proved to be the best? Today some know it to be the Enhar project, the rule of ice. The three centuries of the fall would see the decadent and gradual destruction of the old dominion, threatening the very existence of humanity in the continent of Surtosis. In Avalheim, the fate of humanity would mirror in this almost the last detail. The burning of Yggdrasil saw the very foundation upon which Norse civilization was built turn to ashes. Human society in the north was largely based on the belief of Valhalla, the constant strive to prove oneself in the eyes of Odin and his Valkyries. In order to be lifted from the realms of mortals and into the eternal high table where the Ainahar, glorious warriors of the gods, would wait for Ragnarok. With the end of the Last Crusade, however, Ragnarok was over. The prophecies that had shaped the Norse for generations had come to pass only to be proven false. The gods were dead, together with a host of mortal warriors in working hands, the Ainahar were nowhere to be found, and the Valkyries had disappeared leaving even the greatest and most heroic deeds unrewarded. For decades, only Loki's monstrous children would serve as a sad and deadly reminder of the gone might of the Nord Pantheon, roaming the land mad and unchecked, plaguing upon humanity and wreaking havoc wherever they appeared. Lack of manpower and superstitions based on generations of tangible religion would bring to a halt any raids to the rich lands of the south, for few were those who would dare brave the wild waters of open sea without the blessing of the gods. Such superstitions were not without some merit, for, in the absence of the gods, the sea yontar that plagued the deeps would slowly start testing their might against human ships. For the first time in their remembered history, the Nord stood alone to face the challenges of the North. It is a testament to their mentality and metal that the name Mannheim is first mentioned already at this time, the Nords laying claim on the land they were supposed to tame anew. But the limitation of this seafaring and raiding nation to land, coupled with the dismantlement of its entire pantheon, would bring a cultural and resource crisis equal to that suffered by the Old Dominion at the same time. While war between the different Norse settlements had never been lacking, the mortal spiritual leaders that had led it in check had now lost credibility and importance. Bloody chaos ensued, and more than one instance over two or three warbands came battling each other on the same field and at the same time in a bloody free-for-all that would see entire settlements be left without warriors and therefore either quickly abandoned or as people forced into servitude. In time this would perhaps prove a blessing in disguise. The smaller settlements were absorbed by larger ones, and more importantly, the scattered warbands would slowly turn into cohesive forces, capable of securing the settlements and even take the offensive, hunting and killing the monstrosities that plagued them. Mortal leaders with a solid grip on their power would eventually rise and lead with iron fists, tackling problems as those were rising to the best of their ability. Manpower was stabilized as the lack of raids kept all capable hands stranded on Mannheim, and mankind would slowly gain control of their fates, proving their mettle without gods. The Nords had risen to the challenge that their land was, to stand their ground where no one else had ever dared, while plans for raids were being made and see Yontar be damned. It was a true and hard victory for mankind of the North, even if it was short-lived. For with the protection of the gods gone, it would not take long for a forgotten enemy to resurface. 
defeated and banished ages ago by the Asir and the Vanir, the wildest of Yontar would have sought refuge in the harshest, most unforgiving places on Mannheim. But the winds of power had changed in the north, and its howl on the mountain slopes sang a different tune. From her icy throne on Fjeltorp, highest peak of Mannheim, Hel, queen of the frost giants, and some say Loki's daughter had watched the smoke of burning Yggdrasil rise to rival the mountain she sat upon, the flame that swallowed the world tree dancing in her cold blue eyes as she smiled. What a wonderful new sun this is, the ice Edda claims, she remarked, and how wonderful it will fade. What a glorious night of cold and darkness it will dawn. And slowly she turned those eyes to gaze upon the lands of mortals. The exalted. Survival in the frozen lands of Mannheim demands a particular mindset, ruled by the immediate and practical concerns of food and safety. Thus the Norse have not forgotten the basic tenet for leadership. Power belongs to those who can seize it, while having the blood of a living legend coursing through your veins, granting you strength, speed and power beyond mortal limits does not grant you the right to leadership, it does make it a lot easier to claim it. As a result, while not all Nord lords share the blood of the Einhar, many do. Aside from this leadership in the Nord lands, takes a very simple structure. At the very top stands the High King, a position created in the aftermath of the Jotun War, recognizing the need to unify the Nord lands to ensure survival. The title is mostly ceremonial, naming a first among equals rather than an emperor or overlord. The position is commonly held by Arjenbjorn, the Einhar ruler of Arheim, but he has relinquished it to challengers who have shown promise before. Below stands the Kongur. Each of these men have earned the right to sit at the high table at the banquets held in Arheim by the High King. Although little is known regarding the powerful oath the Yontar swore to the Einhar, it is suspected that the power to compel these powerful beings is shared with those present at these gatherings, but it remains hearsay and suspicion. None have dared anger the Einhar or undermine the oath by sharing its secrets. Until they are chosen by the High King, those who would become Konguir possess almost as many titles as their leaders themselves. Some claim the title of kings, others call themselves Jarls, others are called chieftains, others still would be hard to distinguish from bandit leaders. However, each of these lords is surrounded by his chosen men. While the term refers to one's personal guard, in reality they are much more than that. Bodyguards, friends, vassals, and champions, these warbands can display tremendous variations as each man has been handpicked by the Lord to reflect his chosen form of warfare. Half-bloods. More so than any other culture, myth and history are woven into a single tapestry for the Nords. Their legends still walk among them as living, breathing proof that the myths are very much part of their lives. But the Einhar were meant to be powerful, glorious combatants who would save the world in a single incandescent release of fury on the field of battle. They were never expected to survive, much less breathe. The half-bloods are the first and faintest shadow cast by the Einhar, mortal vessels twisted by the exalted blood they inherited from their divine parents. The descendants of these mighty heroes often inherit portions of their awesome gift, but regretfully lack the control or grace of the parent. Stronger, faster, and possessing senses far beyond the keen of mortal men, as children of the blessed Einhar, they should occupy a position of prestige and power. But the truth, like in almost all cases with half-bloods, is somewhat more complicated. The ogres possesses the strength of ten men, but the intellectual capacity of a small child, while the Valdir, the skin changer, possess the amazing ability to shift into beasts and back, but with none of the control of their ancient forebearers. The stalkers have inherited their keen senses of the greatest of hunters, and find themselves repealed by the scents and sounds of community. Even the trolls, shunned and feared as they are, were once numbered among the great tribes before hardship and impossible choices forced them a down a dark path. It would be easy to differentiate between the exalted and half-bloods by placing the first closer to the Einhar's divine nature and the half-bloods closer to their bestial devo devolution. 
But this is an unfair oversimplification. The two, after all, walk hand in hand for the Nords. The difference rests not on power or control, but in ambition. Should the half-blood individual possess the will to regain control of his gifts, he could very well walk in the footsteps of the Einhar. But whether by choice or simply passive acceptance, the half-bloods heed the wild call of their Einhar blood. Mortals. Surrounded as they are by the glorious remnants of a bygone age, it is an understandable mistake to discount the threat the mortal populace of Mannheim represents. This would be a mistake almost invariably a fatal one. There are people who have survived Ragnarok, the twilight of the gods, the Fimbul winter that followed, and the rule of the Yontar. Mere survival in Mannheim is an accomplishment, and when one faces Nord Raiders, one does not face those who merely survived, but those who thrived. Each year, hopeful youths gather at Arheim or at one of the lesser coastal settlements for a spot on the longships. Competition is fierce, but seldom lethal, as manpower and healthy workers are always in demand in the harsh Nord lands. Those that succeed are rewarded one of the few chances at advancements in the North. Raiding While a single successful raid can see all of the crew return wealthy enough to support the entire community for years, a successful series of raids can find a humble raider chosen by his liege to join his Huskarls. Huskarls and their families need not toil for survival. Their sword arms and discipline are in such high demand that lords see to all their needs, allowing Huskarls to spend their time training and sparring, making them a formidable force on the battlefield. Particularly successful and ambitious Huskarls often rise to the rank of Jarl themselves, employing Huskarls of their own to protect their lands and property. From there, they are only a single deed away from being recognized by the High King and joining the ranks of the Nord Kongir on the high table in Arheim. Deeper in the shadows, often hidden behind misdirection and bodyguards, walk the Shaman and the Volvas of the North. The Shaman and are powerful figures whose auguries can send the raiding fleet hurling across the icy expanse of the White Waste. The Volvas have been preaching the divinity of the Einhar to all who will listen, and their cults have been growing steadily despite fierce opposition from the various objects of their reverence. Relegated to advisory roles, their words and workings are seldom ignored by those in power, for their influence plays a pivotal role in the motivation and guidance of the Nord war hosts. The Blooded when the Nords first began raiding the northern shores, the panicked populace of the newly fledged kingdoms described them as terrors, goblins and monsters. Only in time as the skirmishes escalated and the initial panic eased into daily fear were they recognized as human. It is only the wise who know how close they came to the truth in those first days. The Ahar were meant to fight and die gloriously on Ragnarok, so when Yggdrasil's spire undertook the Ahar project, they paid no heed to the long-term effects of their process. By creating a self-evolving system linked to the subject's subconscious and massively reducing the metabolic rate and speed at which these changes occurred, they significantly reduced the odds of tissue rejection as the subject subconsciously chose their development path. As the Einhar survived and bred, their latent gifts resulted in their gradual dissemination of their blood throughout the Nord population. One would assume the first generations would be the most obviously gifted with their divine parents' gift, but this was not the result in most cases. Many Einhar were simply sterile, others fathered monstrous offsprings of which the Ugur are the most common, but the majority fathered normal children who had a fraction of their divine essence dormant within their bodies. In time, these descendants would marry and interbreed, combining these gifts in a completely unplanned and unprecedented manner. For most, these would fail to spark a change, but for some individuals, the mixture of the divine essence would spark a change. Thus are the Ugur still occasionally born to mortal parents, thus are the Valdir born susceptible to the Fenrir curse, and thus are born those who through skill, patience, and sheer will can tame their raging gifts and be truly called blooded. Whether fate or chance or simply accident, provided the blooded their gifts, few can argue that they are more than human. The physical appearance of the blooded can vary significantly, although most tend towards the massive proportions of the divine forefathers, 
Many see physical gifts and martial prowess and consider the blooded lucky, unable to understand the combat that rages within each of these individuals. The wild blood of their divine ancestors cannot be easily denied, and they are prone to fits of maniac energy and rage almost as often as periods of doom and despair. Their gifts manifest erratically, their senses sharpening until the stimulus overwhelms them, while other times a hyperactive adrenal system makes them insanely aggressive and violent, unable to trust themselves. Many of the blooded chose the path of the recluse and the wanderer, fearing themselves more than they fear the dangers that lurk in the wilds of Mannheim. More at ease with the bestial side of their blood, they often form strong kinship with those who are so marked by divine blood regardless of their own heritage. Their intuitive understanding of the burden and struggles they all endure is coupled with the physical might to impose themselves on those who could challenge them. When raids are planned or mustered drawn for battle, clever jarls and kings will seek out the blooded within their realms and entice them to service to lead the wilder elements of their forces. The blooded thus stalk across the battlefield like demigods of old, leading a monstrous host straight into the heart of the enemy forces. Jarl while the Nords often ridicule their subtle cousins in the Hundred Kingdoms for the sheer variety and profusion of titles that the nobility uses, the truth of the matter is that the Nords' description is no less complex or confusing despite the seeming simplicity of it. Nords effectively recognize but two titles, the Jarl and the King. The title of Jarl is perhaps the most misleading. Much like the word Lord used in the Southern Lands, there can be a great gulf between two different individuals addressed by the same titles. The same holds true in Norse society, where Jarl remains a recognized leader of men, but the number and quality of the troops at his disposal can vary wildly. In the southern coast of Mannheim, where the weather is a little sweeter than in the north, and the sea provides its bounty through both raids and fishing, a Jarl might rule over no more than one prosperous town or village, but still manages to support a standing fighting force of over a hundred hard-bitten raiders and huskarls, doubling or tripling that during times of need. On the other hand, in the deep north where only small communities of few people can be sustained, a yard's available manpower shrinks tremendously, often resulting in situations where a single yard and his hand-picked chosen men range over a large area, hunting and tracking outlaws and predators. The gap is further within due to another powerful de detriment of yard's status and resources, one's command of ships. Having the ability to entice warriors the promise of plunder and the income provided by the same, southern Jarls often command enough warriors to commit half their forces to raiding year-round, without having to sacrifice on efficiency on their dwellings other operations. All the while, the income and glory from successful raids adds to a Jarl's prestige, bringing even more men willing under their command. With this imbalance of power, it comes down to the last variable in a Jarl's power a seat at the High King's table. Long ago, while the very survival of the Nords was in question and the Einhar still roamed the lands unchecked, the most far-seeing of them realized that without some central leadership, the war against the Yontar would fail. As a result, the title of High King was reluctantly created to grant one individual the power to direct the Nords as a people in time of need. Traditionally held by the most powerful of the Einhar, today that role is served by Arnbjorn, the father of ogres. Over time, his role has evolved to become less of a leadership role and more of a financial educator. It was in this capacity that he, showing far deeper cunning and foresight than his jovial and simple demeanor suggests, established the tradition of the high table. Each summer solstice coincidentally chosen so that the weather is at best and the southern Jarls have most of their forces committed to raiding, the High King hosts a feast during which he recognizes the efforts of the most dedicated and loyal subjects. Those few who have earned the title of King are invariably invited, but most of the seats at the table and the attendant largeness that comes with it are usually granted to Jarls, with a heavy skew to those who rule in the north. Gold and silver are distributed lavishly by Arnbjorn during the high table, allowing the northern Jarls to compete with their southern peers for manpower, even as he assigns duties to his Ugur children, once more favoring the northerners. 
Most importantly though, all the Yawls at the high table are invited into the annual victory celebration over the Yontun. This anniversary is commemorated in secret, being in true more ritual and practice than a celebration. Almost nothing is known of what transpires in the deep caves and woods where this ritual was undertaken, but one fact remains. Those Jarls so favored are capable of calling upon the ancient oaths of service that bind the Jotun into service, bolstering their forces with the raw might of the Yontar. Shaman The position and role of Shaman once commanded a great deal of respect in Norse society. Before the coming of the Einhar, they were the only force capable of blunting the worst excesses of the Fimbul Winter and the Yontar. Their rune casting and mist weaving could and did save countless villages from extinction. During the war with the Yontar, shaman were often found at the right hand of the Einar, granting their wisdom and guiding them through the many difficult decisions that have that had to be taken. Given the pivotal role they played in the survival of the Nord people, one would expect their station to be rather more exalted than it currently stands. Reduced to living on the edge of what villages will take them, shaman have fallen in hard times. This decline can be directly traced to the rise of the Valkyr cult as a force within Nord society. The conflict between these two forces within Nord society was perhaps inevitable. The shaman had long treated with the Einhar and the god-blooded as allies and equals. And then they saw mortal men with tremendous gifts that had to be guided and controlled, lest those gifts overwhelmed them. A narrative which stood at complete odds with the fierce worship of the Valkyries offered to the Einhar. And when the popularity contest is between an organistic female warrior cult that worships living gods and crabby old men in the forest, the outcome was never in doubt. As more and more of the Nords turned to the new cult, the shaman found themselves shunned and ignored. As their influence waned, so did their fortunes, as even their greatest allies, the Einhard themselves, slowly vanished the twin plagues of violence and their own gifts. Those few who remained possessed too little influence to protect their erstwhile allies, and the shaman were forced to live on the edges of Norse society. Driven from the comfort of what civilization exists in the north of Mannheim, only the most powerful, ruthless and resourceful of the shaman have survived. Their proud duels and conflicts are now a thing of the past as all the considerable resources these gifted individuals is bent on reversing their decline. The last few winters have once more witnessed a renaissance of sorts for the shaman in Norse society. Their gatherings at the sacred stones of Arheim have resumed, even if only under the threat of retribution from the Grey Mane, the only Einhar the Valkyries will not challenge. Gifted young men are slowly drifting into their orbit once more, and the refined knowledge of these powerful elders is being bequeathed to a new generation. With their increased visibility and activity, some captains have even taken to bringing them along on raids. Long forgotten and fallen into disuse, the mace-weaving powers of a shaman are quickly regaining the respect of field commanders. The ability to calm the weather is a tremendous aid when crossing the white ways, while the mists help their forces close the unsuspecting enemy foes with ease. Even the old tradition of rune casting, long persecuted by the Valkyries, is being turned to the benefit of the Nord war machine. Under these twin blessings, Nord captains who brave the displeasure of the cult are achieving tremendous success, their forces striking where their foe is at weakest, while under the cover of mist and shadows. It remains to be seen where this newfound success will allow the shaman to regain a portion of their old influence or trigger a bloody intersign conflict with the increasingly agitated Valkyrie cults. Konungir The frame leadership of the Nords respects only one thing, power and strength. Less than a dozen leaders among the Nords can claim and hold the title of Konungir. Ultimate recognition of this accomplishment is an invitation by Angborn, last of the Einhar and titular High King of the Nords, to the High Table of Arheim. Volva Volvas are the smartest and most ambitious of the Valkyries, who have risen to the positions of command and authority within the cult. Schooled in the rituals and mysticism of the Valkyrie cult from childhood, they have untangled the mysteries of faith-based magic and can lead their followers to terrifying heights of religiously fueled violence, both on and off the field. Vargir Lord 
Not all who are granted the curse of the Vargir succumb to it. While most are capable of retaining some semblance of humanity, few could be said to have prospered. The Vagir Lord represents those that have reached the pinnacle of control over their form. Capable of controlling their change, these savage warriors have managed to retain their human minds in their bestial forms, creating a perfect mixture of animal savagery and human cunning. Quickly establishing their dominance over their feral brethren, these terrifying warriors take to the field with a twisted menagerie of monster followers, falling upon the hapless foes in an avalanche of tooth and claw. Thing. Any Nord leader worth his salt keeps a retinue of huskarls close at hand to enforce his will on rebellious vassals and fight off raids. The leader of the huskarls is often a Teng, a wealthy warrior who has managed to earn his lord's implicit trust while maintaining a good relation with the landed huskarls. Unlike the chosen who serve as bodyguards and wartime companions, a Teng stands by his lord at all times, ensuring the shield line holds on the battlefield and that taxes and oaths of fealty are administrated off it. Raiders Life in Mannheim presents tremendous dangers, even the most mundane of professions. Villages in the north do not dot the countryside, but rather perch atop defensive locations, their palisades manned at all hours, with every able-bodied man ready to fight at a moment's notice. If the neighboring villages won't raid them for their resources, the land itself would pit its hungry children against them. Resources and safety in the north are so scarce that one's place in society must be earned as privilege through skill at arms or hard work. While the old gods are gone and the promise of Valhalla has faded, the harsh realities of Mannheim ensures their paradigms endure. A Nord standing in his village is determined by his performance in the Kappa Gorask, a trial of passage held in the early spring. Its significance is such that it can only be officiated by the high Gothi of a region, thus dozens of youths travel each year from their encampments to the ritual grounds outside the largest settlements. What follows are the trials of martial skill, endurance and courage set to separate the weak from the strong. Those who fail are ritually shorn of their manhood, their hair cut short and condemned to the status of thralls, bound by a lot to proven warriors. Thralls are expected to work in their master's household, thus in theory at least, warriors are free to devote themselves to the defense of their house and village. Manpower, however, in the north, is such a precious resource that a household cannot afford to squander it if it is to survive. Master and thrall often work side by side, reaping what meager spoils they can from the frozen lands and the seas of the north. The only true prospect of advancement for the average Nord is to earn a seat in one of the raiding vessels. Each year, immediately following the Kappa Gorask, hundreds of freemen flock to the southern coastal towns where the long boats dock. Only the hungriest, most driven and powerful of the newly minted warriors undertake this journey, for the price of failure is high. Missing even one season of work in a young household can doom it come the winter while the lack of a strong arm to protect it makes it easy for prey for predators both human and monstrous. Among those that do make the trip, only a few are selected to join the raiding parties. When the plan is to sail in enemy waters and land on enemy shores, isolated and cut off from reinforcements, a captain wants to be surrounded only by the finest and strongest and most dependable. For those, however, that do make the journey and catch the eye of one captain, the sky is the limit. Given the realities of daily life in danger in Mannheim, ship captains command an incredible amount of respect. While the southern kingdoms might count their power and wealth in terms of land and coin, the Jarls measure power and influence in the number of ships they command. Despite this small distinction, the truth is that much like in the feudal realms of the south, all power flows from the kings to the Jarls and thence to the ship captains. The wealth can be earned in a single successful raid far eclipses anything a Nord might hope for while working on its own land. If particularly lucky, a raider could secure enough captives, wealth and booty to truly secure his household and devote himself entirely to the perfection of his martial abilities. In time, armed and armored by the wealth of the southern kingdoms and forging the heat of battle and ruthless cold of the north, a raider could hope to ascend to the rank of Huskarl, a dedicated elite warrior bearing arms for his Jarl. 
stalkers. In the harsh climate of Mannheim, possessing the divine blood of the Einhard is a tremendous boon, but much like everything else in the north, it comes with a cost. As is often the case with the blooded individuals, the greater the concentration of divine blood in them, the greater the power and earlier in its manifestation. Legends tell that Aswald, the loud, greatest of all stalkers, was born with these gifts. Unable to quiet his crying, his desperate mother was driven to abandon him in the forest, hoping the cold would kill the child quickly. The legend goes on to tell the tale of how Aswald was found by a pack of Fenrir, who miraculously chose to nurse him rather than devour him. In time, Aswald would become one of the most renowned heroes of the Nord, stalking his monstrous prey, flanked by the Fenrir pack he came to dominate. For most stalkers, the onset of their powers is more gradual, as they manifest the din and clamor of the village life makes it impossible for them to sleep or concentrate, to say nothing of the stench their nostrils bathe in at all times. Slowly driven from their homes, they soon find a peace of sorts in the frozen forests and mountains of Mannheim. There, their gifts allow them to thrive like none others could. Invariably becoming accomplished hunters and woodsmen, they develop some rudimentary control over their abilities. In time, they find it possible to return to civilization, bearing rare pelts and trophies for trade. But almost invariably, the clamor of village life will once more tire them, and the frozen north always beckons. After a few days or weeks of civilized life, will exhaust a stalker and they will return to the quiet harsh embrace of Mannheim's frozen lands. It is not uncommon for stalkers within the region to develop a camaraderie of sorts. Unlike the usual Nord ways, this is not forged over roaring flames and flagons of mead, it is rather a quiet communion conveyed across leagues and seasons, through rock piles and broken twigs, through firewood catches and hidden ratios. Face to face meetings are rare, driven mostly by a chance or necessity. Loners by choice, the stalkers will readily band together when needed to take down fearsome prey or tackle a danger greater than they could handle on their own. It is not uncommon for stalkers to answer a darling ship's captain's call to a raid. While booty and trolls hold little appeal, the call for exploration, experience and discovery echoes ever loudly in their hearts. The sheer diversity in scents and sights that the Sunlands offer is surer a bait than uh, any promise of glory or plunder. It is a fortunate captain indeed who can count on a stalker band amongst his forces. These master woodsmen are invaluable during a raid, eliminating sentries and cutting off lines of supply while the main force moves into position. Once the battle is met, stalkers provide much needed range cover for their brethren before wading into combat themselves. Werewargs. Much like the Ugur, werewargs are seen as the children of the Einhar Vargir, known for his shape-shifting abilities. They are more correct than they know. Werewargs are born when a bloody descendant of Vargir is bitten by a warg and somehow survives. The influx of warg DNA triggers the latent abilities, but lacking their forefathers' control, it does so uncontrollably, triggering each time the warrior is stressed or injured. In battle, these changes are triggered in a relentless cascade, their bodies reverting to their primordial form, healing them of all injuries sustained, but exacting a terrible toll on their metabolism, making them beasts unstoppable, ravenous horrors the world has learned to fear. Ugur The Ugur occupy a very strange place in Norse society. They are the exalted progeny of demigods, capable of doing the work of a dozen men and terrifying foes when aroused to anger. On the other hand, it is difficult to stand in awe of a being that is challenged by numbers that exceed a single digit, simple concepts such as personal hygiene or the mind-boggling mechanics of doors for that matter. Regardless, Ugur are a tremendous asset to whatever community they are assigned to, a fact that the Einhar Angborn, High King of Mannheim and Father of Ogres, exploits to maintain the balance of power with the deep cunning one would expect from his corpulent frame and constant inebriation. After all, there are few creatures on air that will not pause and reconsider any rash action when faced with a single-minded aggression of an Ugur band. Huskarls. While raiders might form the bulk of a Nord expedition, a wise Jarl will always look to secure the services of his Huskarls for a raid before even considering the enterprise. 
These men are the survivors of a dozen raids, wealthy enough to no longer need to work the field and instead devote themselves to the pursuit of war exclusively. Armed and armored with their loot and rewards of dozens of a dozen raids, Huskarls are the solid backbone around which a raid is organized. Disciplined and experienced, these are the men who can be counted on to march through withering fire and hack down the door of a walled settlement or face the fury of a cavalry charge without flinching. While their banter and camaraderie is a far cry from the disciplined behavior of the Imperial Legions or the Household Guard, Huskarls are every bit as dangerous and professional an opponent as one can find on the field of battle. Trolls While they don't like admitting it, all Nords know that they share a bond of blood with the trolls who sacrifice more than any other to secure victory over the Yontar in battles that have been swallowed by myth and legend. Today, trolls march at the vanguard of most Nord forces, their pre-natural endurance and healing abilities allowing them to shrug off even the most powerful weapon of the enemy. Fenrir Beast Pack Massing almost half a ton and porting massive fangs and wicked claws, the most terrifying trait of the Fenrir Beast Pack is its cunning intellect. Closer to what one would expect from apes, those wargs that consent to join a host in battle can be found ranging ahead of the main force, hunting light cavalry and skirmishers before turning to fall upon the flanks and rear of the engaged enemy. Valkyries Steeped in violence and combat, the Valkyrie cult loudly proclaims the divinity of the Einhar to all who will listen. Soldier brides to their living gods, they stand ready to give their lives for their divine champions on and off the field. Their own message counters that of the Einhard themselves who worship the old gods who died during the Ragnarok. But who better to ascend in the first place than the living champions who shepherd humanity during the darkest times? Ulfendar Few who look upon the Ulfendar on the field of battle realize that these raging barbarians are in fact a warrior lodge whose origins predate the veneration of the Asir and the Vanir, descending upon their folk clad in their ceremonial furs and armed with twin blades, these virtual warriors are a menace to all who would stand in their path, their frenzied state injuring them to fear or pain. Fast, savage and deadly, the Ulfenhard Close with their opponents with terrifying speed, their twin blades whistling as they carve a path of savage mayhem through the enemy's vulnerable flank and reed. The Mountain Yontar Following Ragnarok and the burning of Yggdrasil, the Jotun threatened all human life in the northern continent. The emergence of the Einhar from their slumber brought their dominance to an abrupt and final end. With their greatest shaman king broken, the Jotun were made to bend the knee and swear allegiance to their Einhar and the, their human subjects. Today, the few remaining Einhars can grant truly exceptional leaders authority over one of these towering behemoths. Strong and tireless, a Jotun is a priceless asset to the community he is assigned to. Some enterprising Jarls are willing to bring them along on raids. Ruinously expensive to transport and feed while at sea, Jotun soon proved their value on land. Towering over 6 meters, a mountain Yontar is a primordial force of destruction on the battlefield. Their powerful limbs can shatter a shield line in a single blow, hurling full-grown men through the air like they were toys. Ice Yontar Few and far in between, Ice Yontar are the nobility of their kind and the most powerful of the Jotuns. Gifted with an innate mastery over storm and ice, their massive forms are sheeted in heavy ice and rime, allowing them to wade into battle unscathed while conjuring jaded shards of ice from thin air to hurl at their foes until they close the distance with their hapless foe. Stabbed of his strength and vitality by the aura of a natural cold that retters their titanic forms, foes are easy prey to these massive warriors. See Yontar in ancient times, so long gone as to have passed from legend to myth, the Sea Yontar challenged the Ice Yontar for the leadership of their people and were only defeated when their dim mountain kindred joined the opposing side. Forced to swear mighty oaths of fealty and service, they were nonetheless exiled from Jotunheim, forced to make their homes in the waters around what were once their lands. 
grown strong and powerful again by the bounty of the ocean. When the Einhar awoke, the sea Yontar were drawn into combat against the Einhar by the ice Yontar rulers, only to see their oaths and fealty transferred to the victorious humans. Centuries of hunting and feasting upon the bounty of the deep ocean have made them powerful and honed their cunning, making them an ideal battlefield asset for those formidable enough to enforce the authority of the ancient oaths. Bersarks Born of the ancient hunting lodges of the Nords, the Bersarks have long been a terror on and off the battlefield. Their insular nature, occult practices, and unbridled ferocity have made them dangerous to both ally and foe as most Bersark's lodges make ends meet as brigands and raiders among the Nord lands when not directly employed by an enterprising Jarl or Shaman. On the battlefield, their unbridled ferocity, disregard for danger, and brutal strength make them ideal frontline combatants, while their vicious two-handed weapons make a mockery of whatever defensive formation the foe might hide behind. Situation in Mannheim While it could be easy to dismiss Nord culture and politics as crude, simple, and brutal, any who made that mistake would not survive for long. Brutal? Yes. Crude and simple? No. It is easy to forget that Mannheim has seen the rule of dragons, the Yggdrasil spire, the Yontar, and only recently that of men. All of these were cast down in cataclysmic battles, but their remnants still linger, stirring the frigid land. Arrayed against forces both seen and unseen stand the Nords, led by the Einhar, and a handful of others who know of the ancient nemesis that lurk in the frozen shadows of the north. Alas, only a handful of Einar remain. Angbjorn, the mountain, and scorched in Arheim, is doing his best to guide the budding civilization of the Nords away from the many dangers that surround it. Greymane, the wanderer, remains the first and last line of defense in the frozen north, fighting himself as much as the beasts that prowl the darkness. Hroki, Deadbringer, remains a recluse who fights as and when he can. Beyond these, only a few more remain who can still communicate with man, let alone care for the fate of man. The rest have been lost, where to battle like Svartgalm or their own bestial natures, it matters little. Their task would be difficult if conditions were ideal, and they are far from such. Nor society, once monolithic in the support of the Einhar, is riven throughout with tension and simmering conflicts. To the south, prosperous raiding Jarls resent the tribute they pay to the High King in Arheim when most of their prizes go to the northern Jarls at the yearly Almit. Some return from their raids with massive treasures, the likes of which have not been seen in centuries, and they are loath to part with it. Arguments that the northern Jarls have the hardest and least rewarding task of holding back the savage frontiers fall upon deaf ears of their increasingly proud and prosperous southern kin. This alone would be nothing new. There have ever been tensions among the denizens of Mannheim, fueled by necessity and competition for resources. But there are many effective and straightforward ways to settle such differences in Nord traditions. Now these traditions steadily give way to subterfuge and guile beyond the fields of single combat, but leading to the battlefield. Sightings of short and crooked shadows in the halls of many Jarls sow doubt and mistrust among peers with honeyed words and promises of treasures whispered in darkness. Thus emboldened, a few foolish Jarls have pushed things further than ever before. Wielding weapons of unprecedented craftsmanship, they have readily shed northern blood in one-sided duels that threaten to break out into full-fledged feuds among the Jarls. This would do nothing but weaken Norse society. Compounding this increasingly tense situation is the growing assertiveness of the Valkyrie cult. Although they profess a total devotion to the will of the living gods, it is difficult not to notice their views on how matters should be handled are often at odds with those of their chosen divinities, the Einhar. A cynic would further quickly note that there are far more feasts and ceremonies around the Einhar who have fallen in battle or devolved into a bestial state than there are with those who can voice an opinion that might disagree with their vision. Angbjorn, never the most cautious or careful of the Einhar, has already clashed with the priesthood, but lacking their political savvy, he has been outwitted and isolated. The Valkyries would rebuke his efforts, recasting themselves as the victims of a cruel campaign of lies and misinformation orchestrated by the shamans to foment bad blood between the Valkyries and their gods. 
The resulting repression of the shaman cult has weakened the critical pillar of support and counsel the Einhard depended on to influence the more independent Jarls. Those now find their new attractive female advisors, the Volva, irresistible in their counsel, as they garner power by agreeing with their Jarls more ambitious and aggressive tendencies instead of offering wise counsel. It would perhaps be natural for such seems to be the nature of man, Nords or otherwise. When prosperity and riches lie before them, tensions invariably rise as competitors clash even in a land as dangerous as Mannheim. The dangers of the land are far from over for the Nords, and their division would seem untimely, suspiciously so, in fact. Bad omens increase in readings of bones, runes, and entrails as the land itself shakes and shivers. Seers speak of giant serpents that steer in their sleep and entire parties of hunters are lost without explanation or trace. The stalkers speak of unnatural monsters, the spawn of the mad god Loki, awake once more and sowing chaos without pattern, cohesion or purpose. And when the stalkers speak, the wise listen, and what they hear speaks of a reawakening in the far, far north. Still, this is far from a lost fight for the Nords. The Greymane has been seen south of the Long Ice for the first time in centuries. Some even claim to have seen him in Arheim and speculate he has joined forces with Angbjorn as they had of old. Following their savage call, the shamans have regrouped, rumored to be led by Altung, the hoary ancient himself, first of shamans and eldest of the Nords. They have begun exerting their power, reminding the Valkyries, the Nords and their enemies that these old men still wield real power and that all power flows from the edge of the sword. To the careful observer, is it clear that Mannheim and the Nords are changing? The only question remains is, how? Character Portrait Timolen the Lion Emaciated and frail, Timolen has fought for the mo from the moment he was born. He fought the elements for his very life on the night he was born, as his father exposed him to the elements to judge his worth. Surviving that fateful night, he fought to prove his worth and earn his every meal daily. As he grew, he fought for the regard of his father earning his moniker, the Lion, originally meant as an insult which eventually became a mark of grudging respect. When his father died, he fought for his rights as the eldest son, first against would-be usurpers who saw him as weak, as his hall ripe for the taking, but ultimately against his brothers who sought to usurp him. When the world burned and the gods called, Timolin fought for his faith. When the gods fell in battle and the Yontar reigned long before the Einhar arrived, Timolin fought for survival alone against overwhelming odds. When the Einhar arrived, Timolin once again fought, this time for freedom. Except for some of the eldest and most powerful of the Einhar, there is no more relentless foe in the Nord lands, and certainly no man has done more for the survival of humanity in Mannheim. He has, however, won no great battles, slain no foe in personal combat, or claimed any land. His legacy is one of foresight and guile, of retreats and misdirections, of patience and ambush. Above all, it is a legacy of survival and victory. He is the eldest of the shamans, and has long since become something more than man. His powers awaken on the very first day of his life, as his parents exposed him to the murderous cold of the Mannheim Knights. His is gifted with a powerful affinity to two elements with control over both air and water, an exceedingly rare gift among men. Blinded by this rare asset, many people fail to fend off his real power, his native intelligence. In fact, Timolin did not master his gifts until well into his middle ages, tutored, some say, by the gods themselves. Until then, everything he achieved was done through sheer effort, audacity and guile. When the gods fell and the Yontar came, Timolin remained the only human ruler who did not bow to the new overlords. Acknowledging that he could never hold land against the raw power, both physical and elemental, wielded by the Yontar, he forsook his land, but saved his people by adopting a migratory lifestyle. Living off the land and using his powers to scout the paths ahead, he and his tribe managed to stay one step ahead of his opponents. His continuous survival and defiance kept the flame of hope and rebellion alive during those cold years. Although he lost many men, many joined him throughout this ordeal, drawn to his banner by the growing legend of the man who defied the giants. He shared his knowledge and power freely to any who displayed the gift in the ways of the shaman. 
By the time the Ahar arrived, Timula had been fighting for decades and the shaman had become an established force. Old and wizened, he was already older than all the men under his charge who whispered that he had been old and bent when they had joined his banners as youngsters. Recognizing his expertise, several of the Einhar heed his counsel and fought where and when he directed. This alone may have tipped the balance in the war, for while the Valkyries argued that the Einhar's divine power and righteousness cause gave them all the power they needed to cleanse the land, the truth is that the Einhar were few and their foe mighty. Character Portrait Osigny, Daughter of Dorm Though through the mist and night is covered, the future is written, the fates are set, but a destiny is forged, not offer. Such is Mannheim, such is life, such is our burden and our task. Mannheim is no stranger to turmoil and violence. This has traditionally been the case due to necessity in a way. The limited resources, the monstrous threats, even the displays of strength between members of society that venerates bravery in war, they all contribute to a tumultuous life, on top of the struggle for survival. Lately, however, the power struggles in the North have a deeper foundation. Traditional positions of influence have been shifting hands between different groups and there is a war being waged on the very hearts of the Nords, no less bloody than any other conflict on, of Mannheim. Osini Dormdotir is considered a key figure in this war, new war. While the Volva do not have an established hierarchy, at least not one that is seen by outsiders, Osini is widely considered as a mover of pieces among their numbers. She will often visit a hall, paving the way for another Volva to be accepted as an advisor there, but she will also be seen to any hall that already listens to the honeyed words of the seers, spending hours with her sister Volva in private council. From wherever she appears, however, Osigny will not leave alone. Her words may vary, but the result is the same. Be they passionate speeches on the market and trace prophecies before the hall, whispered counsel in the ears of leaders of even gentle, private words of comfort to a mourner or of courage to a fearful young warrior. Osigny inspires and captivates, reigniting the faith to the old gods and a belief of their return. While she denies many, those that end up following her are not few. Such passion and inspiration is rare in the north, and not often welcome in a land where even fishermen and women can fight proper if sufficiently roused. Many are those who speak her name with anger and contempt for the chaos she has sown, but few in her presence. Her wild beauty matched only by her sharp wit, fierce passion and demanding disposition. Osigny knows how to wield all of these tools with skill and few end up denying her in their halls. Fewer still would dare if they wanted to. There are stories about what happens to those that do, from sickness that decimates an entire village to bouts of particularly bad weather that don't seem to acknowledge the seasons and even of lightning storms fueled with the angered moans of the dead gods. Most rational men readily say that these are, of course, simply tales. There are in fact many tales about Osini, both grand and simpler, about her life and deeds, about where she was born and raised, who she was before her destiny was revealed to her and she followed the Volva, never dismissing or correcting any of them. Osini Dormdotir prefers to leave such tales unaddressed and if herself is asked, she replies the single word, Asepa. The Asepa, the prophecy of Ose, is an epic, an Edda known to all Nords. While it revolves around the words of a single legendary seeress, it is considered a tale about all Volva. In it, Ose, one of the original mortals to be offered the power of the Vanir to see through the mist of both past and future, is brought back to life by Odin in order to consult her and benefit from her wisdom and powers both. Most of the Edda in the words of Ose herself who speak of the future to Odin. Events both greater and lesser and of both mortals and gods in Mannheim's history are revealed to Odin by Ose, leading to Ragnarok, which however is never described. The Edda instead recounts how Ose sees she will have to face trials at the hands of Loki and goes on to number them and describe how she will overcome them, yet on the same breath she adds that she will fail to do the one that matters most. Odin that scolds Loki for his future plans offers his sympathy to Ose, but he bids her to take heart for a destiny bright and prosperous for gods and mortals despite her own. 
words filled with tragic irony as the audience of the Erda understands how the trials are to be distraction by the god of mischief so she would not see his betrayal during Ragnarok and reveal it to the gods on that day. Many are those that rush to claim that Osini is none other than the seeress of the Edda herself, thus her responses when asked about her life, but her allies and her enemies seem more to her answer. Osa's response to Odin in the Edda is that the burden of her failure is not hers to bear. Her very last words in the Edda call for her daughters to carry it and repay the gift that, has, that was given by the gods. Those who have spoken to her even once see that Osini Dormdotir carries that burden with fervor and speaks of a gift repaid and the gods return. Instigator of violence and turmoil or leader of a new era that rekindles the old fate, Osini Dormdotir has led both the Volva and Mannheim as a whole into a new world. Words and prayers long forgotten echo around the frozen lands of the north once more. Old places of settlement, long abandoned since the rule of the Yontar, have been revived and filled with those who follow her, and some say enjoy better crops and gentler weather, tempting more to settle there. For a living person, it has hard to say which of these things told about her and her followers are true and which are tales. Harder still seems to guess what her next step will be. While it is doubtful that the shamans will allow their influence to be idly offered to the Volva, and many are those Jarls that saw good, strong men and women leave their side for hers, Osini seems undeterred, and there are some who claim that a boat was sailing, named Aspa, carrying her south. Einar Banmatar, the Reverend Little is known or remarkable about the life of Einar Banmatar, the Reverend of the North. Before he killed a god and became the most hated and feared man in Mannheim. Einar was a hunter, one more nameless denizen of the countless hamlets that sought to survive in the far north. His cunning and skill earned him a good living, which had allowed him to marry and raise a small family. Had he lived anywhere else, this could perhaps have been the sum total of his life's achievement, dying of old age surrounded by a loving family or more than likely died out on the ice, eaten by some ice spawn monstrosity. But this was not Einar's fate. He lived within the territory of Jofur, the boar god of the north, and thus both their dooms were sealed. To understand one, we must delve into the other. Once revered as one of the mighty Einhar, Jofur has been a warrior of great renown. His reckless aggression, fiery temper, and stubborn refusal to die had been the stuff of legend even before he was chosen and became an Einhar. His ascension only heightened these straits further, allowing his heedless charges to single-handedly fell Yontar and shatter shield walls. His reckless nature, however, ensured that he was one of the first Einhar to abuse his powers. His mortal frame, unable to contain his godly gift, soon started changing to accommodate his divinity. This heightened his aggression and fueled his anger, encouraging him to use his gifts more often and recklessly. In a few scant decades, the proud Einhar was gone and Jofur, the divine boar of the north, was born. Even in this devolved form, Jofur served the needs of his people. Given his territorial nature, the boar patrolled his range ceaselessly, and some vestiges of the hero to his people must have survived deep within his damaged psyche despite the transformation, for the boar never attacked settlements. Those who lived within this range developed a dedicated truce with the god beast, planting fields of northern wheat and barley as well as hardly northern orchards along his route that their protector might feast and retain his strength to drive off other predators. This cycle survived for centuries as the protection offered by the boar made the planting of these fields possible, ensuring a tenuous balance that allowed the population to prosper. Fate, however, is fickle and that balance could not last forever. Deep in the northern ice fields, the boar encountered a mighty foe, some whispered it was the spawn of Jormungar, the ward serpent, but none have traveled that far into the ice to find out. While the boar survived this encounter, he was gravely injured. He did not descend for three winters, and without his seasonal patrols, the local predators grew ever bolder, encroaching in his territory. Unprepared and ill-equipped to deal with these northern apex predators, the population was forced to abandon the fields they planted as tribute, focusing instead on their own survival. When the god-beast returned, it was immediately apparent something was wrong. 
Its mighty pelt was torn and bleeding, and all intelligence had fled its maddened eyes. Plowing through the barren fields that had once sustained it, the boar, maddened and hungry, turned its attention on one of the fortified villages that tended to them. Nothing was left, even the wooden palisade had, that had protected it was consumed, and not even one of the villagers had survived. Two more hamlets were lost to the boar's rampage before his migratory path led him onwards, but the villagers knew he would return. Terrified by this display of divine might, the denizens of the range ensued his fields were planted and ready for their next season, sacrificing hundreds to malnutrition, predatory attacks and frostbite to ensure their god was satiated. Their efforts were all in vain. The god beast had consumed the flesh of man and developed a taste for it. So it came to be that the man who would become Einar Batamar returned to his village after a week-long hunt to find it in ruins and the remains of its entire population, his wife and child included, in a steaming pile of refuse amid a gargantuan abandoned rotting hollow. One can only imagine what effect this had had on the proud man, but the consequences were only too visible. The man who would become Einar Batamar gathered his belongings and set out into the ice to hunt down a god. Six months later he returned. The god beast did not. He took up the name Einar, lone fighter, and settled in a small cabin by his old village, determined to spend the rest of his days hunting down the beast that would now plague his people. Initially shunned and ridiculed for his preposterous claim, the coming months and turning of the season proved his point. The god beast was now returning. People started noticing things about him. He hunted Fenrir, and did so alone. The cloaks of bristling fur he wore was made of a single piece with no stitching or seam and his bone-headed spear never dulled or needed replacement. Slowly but surely, people were forced to accept the truth. This man had killed a god. Pride, fanaticism and ambition all ensured that in the following months the challenges came fast and furious. They ended just as quickly once Einar slew Angrim of Fera, Jarl of Langdal, the most feared warrior in the north. Under Nord law, these challenges had made him one of the wealthiest men in the north as the wealth of his challengers became his own. Along with the wealth came the unwanted titles and responsibilities of Jarldom and revealed in hatred, though he is, the people in the reach know him to be their best hope for survival in the coming years. Three views on Mannheim. I know an ash standing, Yggdrasil named, a tall tree bright, its roots holding Weinerheim as one, tying loam with stone. Under its shadow all is warmed, land and heart and mind. Beyond it, through cold rains, o'er all the eyes can see, a land dangerous twice over for predators' fangs and cold claws rain, over white on ground and white on trees and white on sea, till summer comes and golden light reveals. The Old Edda Many are the names by which Mannheim is known, and few of them are flattering. Crucible of Monsters, Cradle of Horrors, Frozen Hell, The Barbaric North, The Everdark. All claim a portion of the truth, but they all also ignore one thing. The land of the Nords holds a wild beauty beyond compare. From its high fjords, scarring the dark northern seas, to the imposing mountain range of Galb, its peak towering above endless dark forests and snow fields. The land of Mannheim holds a dangerous allure, one reserved for some of the sturdiest, harshest, and most enduring people the world has seen. Lying north of the continent of Surtorsis, Mannheim is an island created by the rise of the Gald mountain range. Indeed, with the Gald, with its many peaks perpetually covered by ice and snow, forms the backbone of the island, and while none but the Yontar can endure its cold, it dominates the landscape regardless of where on Mannheim one stands. By many it is considered a different continent than Surtosis, despite its smaller size, as the prevailing theory is that the island rise is, in fact, the result of Surtosis moving to the south, allowing for volcanic masses to rise to the surface. While it is true that a huge part of the cavern system below Mannheim is volcanic, its activity is dormant and there are no known active volcanoes on the island. That being said, most of the Gold Range has not been explored and recorded by humans. Professor Nicolas Ketten, University of Pravia The learned fools of the South speak of the birth of mountain rages and geological incidents. Good for them. Tradition tells another tale, one befitting the people of Mannheim. 
Mannheim is a land between, a fortress world built on the empty bottomless sea of Gingwagapa, the, by the god Bur for his people to withstand the flames of Muspel below coldling with the frozen mist of Nifil above. This myth is unsurprising. It speaks of the same endless conflict between primordial equals as told by the native people of Ea all over. It is the first and last saga, creation and destruction, locked in the endless duel. Unlike in other tales, for the Nords it is hard to tell which is which. Muspel and Niffel are both destructive natural forces that spell doom for mortals and gods alike. The Asir and the Vanir wove their words into the, that tale, but Genesis for the people of Mannheim tells the same tale as those of other peoples with one major deviation. Stability, equilibrium, and what Southerners name balance never came magically and out of nowhere to bring peace to the cosmos and offer a home to the mortals. This age is not safe, and peace never truly settle over the world. The battle between primordials is ongoing. It is only the stronghold of the land between that allows for gods and mortals to endure. It was built by the labor of the gods, lesser beings to such powers as Muspel and Niffel, struggling to preserve against the powers that be. The southern sages may be right. Nifhel, the icy hell in the middle of Nifhel, above, could very well have been inspired by the icy peaks of Gald, its freezing mist born from the windswept snow of its slopes. Newspell could have derived from the volcanic caverns below Mannheim and the fiery nightmares it has spewed on occasion, now mostly forgotten. Right or not, however, those thoughts are meaningless and lose sight of the importance of the tales. Like the right to enter Valhalla, anything and everything is only gained through fight and struggle. They are not choices for the people of Mannheim. They are the means for survival, a state of existence. H. Northern Sage Songs of the Last Fire Child Mannheim is home to many grim tales and horror stories, although to the Nords, true be told, they are simply known as stories. If the darkness and cold does not fuel one, then the monsters that plague the land or the violence of its people do. One legend, however, holds a special place in the cautionary tales grandmothers spin for their grandchildren. The Last Fire Child there are many variations to the tale, but some of its elements always remain unchanged. The Fire Child is an immortal survivor of the army of Sutur, who, plagued by guilt over its crimes and blasphemy, now roams the land and burns those who offend the gods it once helped kill, while abdicating others to exact its vengeance. Beyond that, however, the tale changes. In some cases, it is a fire Jotun who descends upon remote villages, burns them to the ground, leaving behind some impaled denizens around the grand pyre that is fed by the body of the rest. Like scarecrows sending their shadows dancing around the cinders of the village. If those bodies are not found and properly burned in time, the legend says that they will descend from their grisly resting place and join their ranks. In others, the fire child resembles a brown fee creature of dark fire, stealing younglings from their parents. This is a manling with dark red hair who stalks the shadowed corners of a house. The way to spot it is to look for two red blazing spots for eyes appearing in the darkness, often in the gloom of moonless night's forests or under one's bed, in the darkest corner of the room or among the shadows of coats in one's closet. A last variation speaks of an immortal warrior of Sutur whose dead body clad in its ancient crusader armor seems fueled by fire as soft sunlight seeps through its dead, cracked skin. He is most known for challenging young travelers on their way to the Kappa Garosk. Some it lives dead and scorched for the carrions to feed on. Others it takes with him. In all cases, it is said that the crusader sings a taunting rhyme while fighting. The soldier's just a boy, the soldier's just a boy, take his mind and make it toy, the soldier's just a boy. That's a funny one. The last fire child mythos is well established and widely spread in its different forms throughout Mannheim. Eventually the tale lost much of its former fearfulness, to the point that children often use a counting rhyme based on an old song. While children mostly use the last one or two verses in the games, for a fair counting out the full song is used, much to the disturbance of the few southerners that have witnessed it. I like pain. My nightmares are my dreams. 
My soul is slain, my thoughts speak only in screams. Spread it, spread it, spread it, spread it. The day I heard his voice, he told what to do. He told me I must spread it, that's my desire too. One like me I'll gather, oh, happy band of fellows, and all the world will tremble under our lifeless bellows. We'll burn creation merely, hidden from every glance. Beyond its light we'll celebrate and with shadows dance. But if he thinks it's all for him, then let him guess again. I served, I served him, and I did, until my dying breath. A boy he made a soldier, a boy shall end him then. I am the last fire giant, my flames will yet burn death. But first, they will burn you. Whatever the truth behind the legend, few things can be said are true. Throughout modern Nord history, villages have been burned and raised overnight, with pyres of dead made in their center and impaled bodies around it. Children have gone missing on occasion from the, their midnight walks in the woods as much as from the safety of their own beds. And many a lonely aspirant to join the raids by proving themselves have never made it to Kappa Goraskak or back home after doing so. These of course in the unforgiving land of Mannheim do not mean anything by themselves, but if there's anything Mannheim and the Nords teach us is that their frightening tales often fail to capture the horror of the reality behind it. Atir and Things Prominent among the numerous general misconceptions of Southlings about the Nords is that they are one people. That is only as true as it is to claim that the hundred kingdoms are one people, which is to say it is absolutely wrong. First and most ancient distinction is that between Nords and the Sap Mills tribes, which the learned among the Nords will reluctantly admit are considered to be possibly the original denizens of the island. Unlike the Sap Mules, however, which the Nords vaguely and erroneously divide into four great tribes, while they are in fact different people with different cultures, the Nords have been historically united when Mannheim was still Vanerheim, and all Nords venerated the gods of Yggdrasil. This part of their culture past undoubtedly offers a sense of common identity, but only when comparing themselves to the rest of the world. When Mannheim matters are discussed, they are more than ready to distinguish between different groups among them. The most common and honored distinction is that of the Atir, clan divisions based on blood and marriage. One's At is part of one's identity, be they man or woman, and relationship between Atir heavily influence behaviors between individuals. That being said, not all Nords can truly claim they are a member of an At, and most are in fact either indifferent towards them or unrecognized. Alliances and pacts forced generations ago honor bind members of the Atir and friendships between ancestors are fondly remembered and provide fertile ground for future ties. Failing to abide to such traditions and even worse betraying trust and ties between Atir can invoke not just the wrath of gods but more immediately can cause blood feuds that will haunt generations. While the ancient Eddas and sagas are often recited by skalds, it is the tales of such feuds, stories with roots deep-seated in history about vengeance, love, honor, and betrayal that move the Nords most and form the foundation of future sagas. There are nine great Atir on Mannheim, often divided into lesser clans and families with a recent group, the so-called Tent At, the Semerhing, flying banners of a seahorse against a teal field by captains that value bowls of salt and water before those of blood. Distinctions between the Atir are vague and vaguer still are the reasons of their feud. In truth, most Atir have clashed so many times in the past that whenever aggression needs to be justified, it is easy to do so. During the gloom of midday, namely the 2nd and 3rd centuries PR, Blood feuds between the Atir reach such a violent crescendo that without the direct intervention of the Einarhar, it is likely that the Nords would have driven themselves near extinction. But intervened they did and thus the greatest and most enduring cultural distinction between the Nords was born, the Things. To describe the Things as councils would not entirely be accurate. This was the form they took later, when the blood feud wars of the Atir subsided and the Einhar gradually stepped back from the leadership of the Nords. Originally the things were courts, forged by prominent figures of different Atir and presided over by the Einhar. Their role was to settle disputes between the Atir, deciding what 
compensation was appropriate for damage suffered and what penalty befitted crimes committed in order to satisfy the injured party before a blood feud was sparked. Their decisions were not binding save by honor, but one did risk invoking the wrath of its presiding Einhar if the thing's voice was ignored. For the Nords, the advantage of this system was obvious. The things had the opportunity to judge each case separately and there was no guarantee that the same offense would invoke the same response. The disadvantage, of course, was equally obvious. Final word rested with the presiding Einhar and mood preference and above all personal ideology would come to play a part in the decision. In time this created a certain predictability. Helga Nornsdottir, head of the Ting in Arheim, would base her decision on her view about the fate of the Nords and if or how the offense afflicted this. If the offending Atir risked crippling or diminishing the ability of the Nords to raid by damaging a ship or killing a, cap a capable captain, one could expect a severe response by her Ting. Sven Trollblad, on the other hand, always bases decisions on the tradition and edicts set by the old gods, naming them as the only lawmakers the Nords have known. These different approaches came to dominate the Tig's decisions and eventually they would become more streamlined, at least in their philosophy. As the Einhard receded from public life, slowly claimed by their gifts, the Tigs would come to rely on past decisions to continue their tradition and the Tigs would change. While lawmaking would be too strong a term to use, such was loosely the role that the Tigs would come to play, interpreting the traditions set by their predecessors and the Einhard that presided over them. In fact, with the exception of the Danting in the West, where Don the Lawforger once resided, no Tig has any log or catalog of past decisions put in writing, much like they do when it comes to their history. In this too, the Nords rely on memory, song and tale to remember the past. More importantly, with time, the surrounding areas of each Tig would come to regulate their behavior according to his decisions until eventually those would become part of traditions. Customs would be adhered to and differ vastly from those of their neighbors. Thus distinct cultural groups would be forged and simple things like the manner a shield must bear its color, proper greetings between different atir and styles of clothing, all details contributing at one point or another in a case presented to the ting, make it obvious to a nord about before which ting a visitor or invader appears. With the exception perhaps of the fim ting across the sea, these loose distinctions do not hold any administrative value save for convenience and tradition. There are no real borders or lines between the things and that truly and honestly divide their people, nor does any thing claim dominion over an area. In fact, many a settlement will participate in more than one things, possibly for different matters in each. In theory, any leader of a settlement, any head of a family, or elder of an et could appear before any tig to present and discuss their case. But not knowing a tig's tradition and mentality can bring forth unexpected results and thus it is avoided. Despite this, the importance of the Tigs in the cultural divisions of the Nords remains. The closer one lives near a Ting city, the closer the feeling of belonging and stronger its influence over everyday lives. Their sense of justice and their customs and in times of turmoil, some certain camaraderies between these different groups has already been shown. For now, the high table serves as the greatest equalizer and unifier, the Ting of Tings, so to say. But with Angbjorn increasingly indifferent to the power plays of his Konungir and the political and even spiritual unrest that boils under the surface of Mannheim, it is possible that such differences will be brought to the forefront utilized by those who reveal and division. Great explorers, greater storytellers. When most denizens of the Hundred Kingdoms think of the Nords, certain perhaps stereotypical traits come to mind. Raiders, drunkards, barbarians, savages, heathens, and other such flowery traits are attributed to the denizens of Mannheim. Yet despite the somewhat warranted infamy, as nor raiding parties are numerous and quite unpleasant to deal with, there is one aspect of these northbound people that often goes unrecognized. Exploration. For all intents and purposes, the Nords are inherently free-spirited and adventure-driven, completing ever more daring deeds to fuel their illustrious sagas. Such a mindset along with unparalleled seafaring skill makes for tenacious and fearless explorers. With some of the culture's most famous voyages bordering on the realm of myth due to the sheer scale. 
I'm walking out to approach the subject of Nordic explorers without mentioning the figure that acted as the source of inspiration for many would-be adventurers. Huel, the fisherman. Huel's story famously fuels the holiday of the Night of the Burning Tree. It is a tale of hope and sacrifice, both for those who walk hand in hand for the Nords. And yet the tale's many iterations inspired more than a tradition for the longest night of the year, and for many the brave fishermen sailed beyond the edge of all known things, becoming a star to guide sailors. Harald's giant's bane was one of the many souls that lusted to, fi- to find the star sea of Huel for himself, wishing to sail his vessel beyond the end of all realms. Before the last act of his story played out, Harald giant's bane was a warrior of great renown, conducting many successful raids against the milk-blooded denizens of the south. Tales tale of Harald's inhuman strength, with some claiming that the Nord warlord once arm-wrestled a mountain giant and won shaming the humiliated titan to the point of self-exile. So many were Harald's victories in combat that his cape was made from the severed beards of his defeated foes, leaving no room for anyone to doubt his might. One faithful knight, bloated with mead, and at the presence of the High King's court, Jens Bane made a promise that would alter his legacy forever. He would find the world's edge and empty his bladder from the precipice to, of eternity. To fulfill his pledge, Harald gathered a fleet of 20 ships and dismissing the notion of Hugel sailing south, he sails northwards. Harald's famed fleet was gone for two winters until a single ship returned to Mannheim on the eve of the third. Aboard were a scant few of the giant's bane men, along with Harald himself. The great warrior whose extremities had fallen off from frostbite was now a raving lunatic. He and his men spoke of a great wall of ice, of titanic monsters that lurked beneath the frigid sea, of savage white-furred beasts that walked on two legs, and of unrelenting winds that flayed flesh down to the bone. Considering the state of the remaining crew's sanity, many saw their tales as maddened ravings. Despite the unreliability of Harold's accounts henceforth, known as the Mad, the denizens of Mannheim found one common point of agreement from his tale. Sailing into the far-flung north is folly of the highest caliber and will only bring about disaster. Many winters after Harold's doomed expedition, another explorer sought to find the world's famed end. Inga Magna Dotir, Igna of Volva's chosen who had forsaken her calling for a life of plunder and adventure, thought to sail westwards for her mission, arguing that the world is a flat circle and then that she could reach the edge by following the tamer western sea currents. Departing with a modest five ships so as to not be hampered by numbers, as was the case with Harald, Inga was gone for three full winters, shocking everyone when she once again reached Mannheim from the east. Magna Dottir's arrival came with some truly groundbreaking claims, with many Norse denouncing her and stating that she was madder than Harald. Inga declared that there was no end to the world to sail beyond, but that the world went on until it brought you back. She spoke of a faraway continent and islands which housed nations entirely locked in conflict. She spoke of horrors that lived beneath the waves and of land broken in two, as if the world serpent itself was wounded there. While Inga's tales are widely dismissed as the product of madness, the seed of speculation has blossomed within many still, with some brave souls wishing to replicate the same perilous journey and uncover the truth for themselves. Yet of all the explorers to grace the many sagas of the Nords, none are as famous or infamous as Ulrich Tortekiltil, who simply came to be known as Ulrich the Unlucky. Ulrich, like many of his kinsmen, craved for adventure and boasting rights that accompany it, showing notable skill as a warrior from a young age. Accompanied by a natural affinity for persuasion and storytelling, Tortikeltil managed to gather a sizable following before departing for his first recorded escapade. His target was the coast of Breonia, where the Nord leader terrorized its poorly defended fishing hamlets and villages. That though quickly proved to be a boresome activity. While attacking a small unguarded settlement, Ulrich managed to capture the local wise woman, who carried with her many secrets and morsels of forgotten lore. The witch, in an effort to save her people, bargained with the warband leader, offering to disclose the location of a hidden druidic village in return. The settlement, the woman said, was nestled deep within the forest of Breonia and housed invaluable treasures within it. 
She assured the Nord captain that he had but a few scant warriors offering bleak resistance to the manpower of his warband. Ulrich, delighted with the idea of a true adventure, left a token garrison of men at the Conqueror's settlement and made his way to the secretive location, guided by the veiled forest paths that the wise woman showed him. A last misfortune struck upon arrival to the secret village. The inhabitants, while few in numbers, managed to kill everyone but Ulrich himself, who made it back to his few remaining men at the coast. Sailing back to Mannheim, the terrified Nord spoke of forest-dwelling superhuman warriors who gained a natural strength by uh, this is too funny by drinking a specially brewed potion. The strongest among them claimed Ulrich was large, fat-laden bear of a man who could hurl a warrior with a single flick of his finger. Almost everyone considered Ulrich a liar, believing that he was trying to hide the shameful defeat by the pathetic Southlanders. The most famous and final of Torquetilly's many escapades, with all of them ending in failure, under outlandish circumstances and with Ulrich as the sole survivor, was his search for Sutur's birthplace. Once again, the Nord Silver Tongue garnered him a sizable warband, promising treasure untold to those that would follow him into the extinguished empire of the Fire Children, Sutur's fallen dominion. The Nordmen traveled south and faced the east, reaching lands with ash clogged skies and the bitter touch of Fimbul winter still lingering within them. It is said that Ulfric managed to reach Solter's mythical birthplace, the first city that gave him form, but no treasure was to be found, only cryptic knowledge and lore that the Nords had no use for. Empty handed, worn out, disease ridden, malnourished, and preyed upon by unnatural horrors, the warband made its way back towards the coast taking what they could from the few locals that still inhabited this diseased region of the world. Tired of Ulfric's false promises and machinations, as the captain began devising a new journey for when they reached the sea, the story concludes with Torquetil's men betraying and killing him, slicing open his back and spreading his ribs out like wings. Ulrich's saga ends with his body being quartered and buried in the dying lands of the east-facing south, so that his cursed unluck might not burden anyone else. Yet Ulrich's legacy survives through his salvaged journal, with many believing his writings to be self-indulgent boasts or fabricated entirely, cataloging tall tales of superhuman villages, mythical lost cities, and feats that best represent the Nord's obsession with adventuring and exploration. The Tale of Ugur Breitstoker the sagas of the Nords are no strangers to tragedy, from the horrifying end of Botegar the Bright to the heart-wrenching fall of the forgotten Valkyrie, and from the treason of Brilhaidu suffered in the saga of the Blooded Ring, to the cold death met by shield maidens Eski and Aneli in the tale of A Sea Apart, the tales of the Nords are filled with loss, pain, and suffering of loves. The events of such tales are harsh, cruel, even meant not to teach or inspire, but rather warn that life can be cruel. People can be petty and mean, and Mannheim is ever deadly. Few tales capture these Nord truths more than the tale of Ugur Stoker, a tale only as old as a hundred years or so. Stoker Ogmodir grew in Jatterheim, a small town deep in the deadly forest under the shadow of the eastern Galad. Living off hunt and timber trade, Stoker was the daughter of a widowed huntress, Ama Boldidotir, daughter of the servant girl Boldi and Ulfir Valdirson, Jarl of Jatterheim. If skalds are to be believed, Stoker was born in the forest on top of a tree while her mother was besieged by a varg below. Thus the name meaning log or piece of wood. Defying the fate of most Ugur mothers, Ama survived but was never able to walk again. Turning to her father for aid in her disability, she was shunned and forced to live and raise her child on the charity and goodwill of others. Wulfir, the tale goes, had no use for her and her malformed brute of a child. As months and years passed, however, Stoker grew. She grew strong and grew a lot, her simple mind instilled in the kindness of the people whose charity had allowed her and her mother to survive. Before long, she was the go-to person for any hard labor in the small town. While she never asked for anything in return, and the tale is filled with stories of people taking advantage of her, many were those who ensured that neither hers nor her mother's bellies would go empty, nor their heart cold. It seemed then that her future was set, but the Norns had other plans for her. 
Witnessing her might after she single-handedly saved fleeing woodcutters from three Varg, old Ulfir saw in her the means to secure his rule in his old age and even expand his dominion and influence in the meantime. The next day he greeted her as a hero of her people and invited her to live with him in his longhouse. Her simple response was as humble as it was defying, giving her her surname and mother. With both Stoker and Ama welcome and splendor in the long house, it did not take long for the Jarl to put her to work. Showering her with titles and honorifics, he had Stoker accompany him in his visits to neighboring towns, entering her in games and duels in a blatant display of power. One by one, other dwelling leaders began to pay homage to the Jarl and Ama, and Stoker wanted for nothing. With his domain secure, Ulfir planned to take her on raids, but this was one thing Stoker refused to do, fearing water and not wanting to leave her mother alone for so long. During the following winter, Ama faded away, her weakened body finally giving up, as the Jarl put it to her. Yeah. The next summer, Stoker was on a ship, bringing riches on top of power to the Jarl. As is often the case in such tales, the Jarl became consumed by his own power hunger, dreaming of a seat in the high table. But as his own body was failing him, old age catching up, the hunger turned to paranoia. Everyone was out to get him, at first from his recently acquired fiefdoms, then from his own town, or even his own sons. One by one, the Jarl's enemies, imaginary and real alike, fell at the hands of Stoker and the poor Ugur maiden from a favorite child of Jatterheim became its accursed terror. The same people that had lovingly cared for her now spitting before the earth she walked knowing her gentle heart would not re reciprocate. It was at that time that Stoker first laid eyes on Leif, son of Lof, Jarl of Vadenheim. Lof had long bent the knee before Ulfir but Leif had other plans. Noticing Stoker's adoring eyes, he approached her, spinning tales of love and adoration. Leif proved careful, calculative, and very patient. He kept his secret love with Stoker going for two years, just until he finally managed to remove his father and take his place. Then he made his first attempt to turn the Ugur against her ruler. The only thing standing between them, he claimed, was the old Jarl. With the innuendos missing their mark, eventually Leif decided on a more direct approach. The time, he said, had finally come for them to be together, but the only way to do so was to elope. He warned her of the night he would come for her and told her that those who knew of their love and wanted to end it would try to stop him, binding her to protect her love when the time came. With the Jarl's strongest protector under leash, Leif gathered his best swords arms and attacked the city under cover of night, murdering and pillaging as they rushed towards the longhouse. Bait in the light of House of Flame, Stoker's self-knit wedding dress and wild berry bouquet shone red and yellow, as did the tears in her eyes, confused and terrified as her beloved and the people of her town clashed. Then, with little guidance but what Leif had given her, she did what she was bid to do. She protected what she loved and fell upon those who attacked the people whose kindness had raised her. Alone she fought the raiders and alone she died. But her actions had allowed the town's warriors to rise swords, shields, and a proper defense. Come morning, she was found surrounded by a mound of dead bodies. Leif's body pinned under hers, and the tail was born. Reaching to embrace him, Leif stabbed her only to be crushed under her. It is always hard to separate myth from fact when it comes to the Nords. But in many ways, it matters little. To this day, the birth of an Ungur is considered a good omen in Jatterheim, and local-born Ugur are fed and taken care of by the town. Last but not least, seasoned warriors and shield maidens, dressed in red and yellow, joined the bride's chosen, an elite unit of warriors. In winter, at times of peace, they assist the townsfolk with labor, but during raids and in time of war, under, under the banner of a golden wedding ring crowned by wild berries, on a red field, the bride's chosen are a force only fools would ignore. Got some nice Viking traditions and mythology in this one. Kind of good, kind of good. I liked it. If you reached this far, like, comment, subscribe, rate. It helps the channel grow. I'll see you in the next one. Arrivederci.